Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More. My name is John Henry Sheridan and today I have Helen Burke with me to have a wonderful conversation. Thanks for being here, Helen. Oh, it's my pleasure, John. Thanks so much. Yeah, I've been, uh, since we met at, um, at that book duelist back in the spring, early spring, I guess it was, uh, yeah, I just felt uh, an affinity towards you as like, I don't know, kindred spirit or whatever. I mean, everyone in the book duelist was, we had a great connection, that whole group. But certainly, uh, you know, when we interacted, I felt um, a kinship, I don't know. Thank you, thank you. I felt the same, John. It was a great group of people. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. it was a rare, rare thing, right? All, all these people that joined the class and then by the time the class ended, it wasn't like sayonara, it was like, oh no, I wanna stay in the class. I think a lot of us felt that way. Yeah. So uh, um, yeah, so beyond that, that, that's how we met. And uh, you know, we've been in contact since then. Um, you're, you and I are both working on a book or books and we'll get to that. So Helen, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you'd like to share? Where are you from? Where are you now? Sure. Um, well, I'm a Philly girl, uh, born and raised, and uh, I've lived just outside of the city someplace or other in recent years. Right now, I'm in the Glenside area of Fort Washington for people that know the Turnpike. Um, so I've done a good bit of traveling in my life, but I have always lived in the Philadelphia area, which is great. Great home mm -hmm. for seasons. Yeah. Uh, so I just had my 70th birthday, so. Oh, wow, fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I could take our time together to catch you up on those 70 years, but we, we don't <laughs> want to do all that. Um, but I, um, I was brought up in a family of five um, and um, went primarily to Catholic schools when I was a kid. Um, got married very young at 21, had five children of my own, um, uh, four of whom are alive and well, and one of whom is in heaven. Uh, my fourth child passed away at, at uh, age seven months. And um, we, as I say, we raised the, the children, grew up in the Philadelphia area as well. Um, after the death of my daughter, I did divorce at a fairly young age, my mid thirties, late thirties, and um, was single for many, many years. And uh, eventually uh, 10 years ago, uh, married a, a, a lovely man. And uh, I now have three stepchildren and their sweethearts and, and a couple more grandchildren. So um, that's my, my family life. What a, what a very fruitful very, very rich very rich yeah. we just celebrated our uh, my husband and i both just turned 70 years old uh in the last two months wow. and we're going to have our 10-year wedding anniversary so we decided to take those anniversaries and have a huge celebration we invited all of our seven children their sweethearts spouses and children uh to the jersey shore for a week and we had a wonderful wonderful time it was a, wow. a a vacation of a lifetime because our kids are hither and yon. Mm -hmm. So it was wonderful to all be together to celebrate. It was wow. that, sounds like you know how to have fun and enjoy your yep. life. Uh, I want to let you know that Allie, our friend Allie Brumwell from also from the book tour ah. says, hello, darling. So wonderful to see and hear you again. Oh, that's great. Hi, Allie. Yeah. Hi, Allie. Thank you for being here. And anyone watching live, thank you for joining and feel free to drop a comment or ask a question to Helen. Um, yeah, and if you're watching the replay, thank you as well. So yeah, so similar to yourself, Helen, I, I grew up in basically one place, um, Brooklyn, and I was here, then I moved a little bit, not far away, uh, here within Brooklyn, and then um, I am back on the same block I grew up on, actually, uh, a few houses from my mother. That's um, great. Yeah, so I know what it's like to be rooted in one place. Uh, I, well, did have the, I did have the fortune to live abroad for a little while. I, I lived in um, Brazil for about half a year and Japan for almost two years. But basically, my heart was always 
I love that, you know, and very important to my life. But uh, my heart has always been in Brooklyn, specifically New York City. Yeah, but really, but really Brooklyn and and even smaller Marine Park, the neighborhood I grew up in. Beautiful. So, yeah. Well, um, I may have mentioned to you that three. Well, one, two. Right now, two of our two of our seven are uh, and their families are in Brooklyn. Yeah, awesome. We have another one in North Jersey, so. Okay, so we're, we're, we're up kinda, in your park. Yeah, sometime. in the neck of the woods. Yeah. Now and then. Yeah. Right, and, and like uh, we just said before we started, you and I were both, uh, you know, a stone's throw away from each other this Saturday, unbeknownst to both of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> at, the in, right. At the farmers market uh, yeah. uh, by Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. That's good. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, Ali says hi, Helen. Um, all right. So next question. Uh, I understand, and, and this conversation can be very flowing and, you know, any which way, right. um, but, you know, questions help guide, guide it. I understand that you have experience as a spiritual counselor, uh, ordained interfaith minister and hospice chaplain. Can you tell us uh, about any of them in particular, but, or specifically about how they all, you know, um, all those unique roles interconnect in, in sure. your, like, grander vision of your life sure well uh actually they're they're the 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 fact that i became an interfaith minister was in service to being a hospice chaplain and the pastoral counseling or spiritual counseling is the is the um the juice the goods that are delivered through chaplaincy so they're really kind of all the same uh gig um, the, um, the interfaith ministry also allowed me the opportunity to, uh, perform ritual weddings and funerals and so forth and so on. So I mentioned earlier that I was, uh, raised Catholic and during the time of my, uh, the loss of my, my daughter, my father, my marriage, you know, uh, uh navigating that with the tools that I had from Catholicism somehow, um, it, it, I, I felt it felt very incomplete, and um, I felt that there was more for me to understand about spirituality in general. And um, I always had a passion for um, <laughs> my children laugh about this. That I've always had a passion for death and dying. Mm -hmm. And I said that mine's mine's. It's going to be really hard to cry at my funeral because I'm going to be so happy to find out what the other side. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. I also had a, 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 an interest in Kubler-Ross and her work. So mm -hmm. go, going back to college, even before, you know, I was a mom. Um, but um, after early after my divorce, I took a job in sales and marketing. And I did that for advertising, sales and marketing. Did that for a very about 10 years as I as the children grew. And it was my way of making a living and making things work. And I enjoyed it very much, but um, I was thinking about this earlier today that there was a day that I was at a trade show, which was part of what I did, the suit and the heels and going around and talking to all my advertisers and talking to editorial about getting them covered and all the things that I did in my job. And I was in London and um, I went back to my hotel room and I looked in the mirror and the words came out of my mouth. I had a terrible, uh, like a cannonball in my stomach, you know? How you, yeah. People talk about having a pain in the pit of their stomach. And I had this cannonball in my stomach and I, I found myself looking in the mirror and saying, what are you doing? Hmm. And in that moment, I knew that th that was not the work I was to be doing. And it took me a little while to figure out what work I was supposed to be doing. And I had um, some nice experiences on my way to um, hospice work. Uh, the, main, the main interesting experience was finishing my bachelor's degree in my late 40s on semester at sea and traveling, traveling around the world. Because at that point, all my children were out of the home and several of them had done semester at sea. So that was very life-changing for me, life-enriching to travel around the world and um, 
I got to go to um, to uh, Kyoto. Mm -hmm. So I saw that I saw on your website that uh, pictures of you uh, being there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know your wife's family is Japanese, correct? Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I lived there for two years and uh, almost and yeah, I spent time in Kyoto, a beautiful place. So I, I anyway, during it, it was at the end of that time that I began to pursue hospice work and mm -hmm. uh, was immediately hired for a marketing position and immediately went into school for ministry for chaplaincy. And there's some great synchronistic stories about how I figured out what role I was best at and so forth and so on. But that's how I found my way to hospice work. And I did hospice chaplaincy for just about 20 years before I retired. Wow. A couple of years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. that's been very, very that's been an amazing blessing. Yeah, I uh, can relate to a couple of things. Um where actually when I was in Japan, I I it was 2011 and 12 that I was living there. And I was wondering if I, when I come back to New York, so I knew I was going to come back here. What am I going to do? Up to that point, I was a guitar teacher mainly. And uh, I didn't know if I wanted to be still. And I had done uh, humanitarian volunteer work in 2010. So that kind of just reshaped the way I was. And um, I was thinking I was somehow attracted to, uh, to hospice and like um, huh. chaplaincy. I remember someone was telling me to look into Kuba Ross at, in Japan, one of my uh, American friends, or yeah, I think it was an American guy. So yeah, I looked into that stuff. It, it wasn't my calling, at least not until this point in my life, but uh, something about, I, I helped a lot of people in my life pass over, you know, elders and generally elders, that I was just a part of that experience for the months or years that were leading up to it. And so I, I have a taste of that. I, I also, um, uh i also have a i wrote a song in in my teen years called nice day to die and it was really just like looking forward to dying basically kind of like like you were saying like i have a uh, i would say a healthy and uh, not obsession but a relationship with death where i yeah. do kind of i like to think about it i think it's helpful to think about it you know and um to see how other people die and because it, it just colors in the way i want to live life right you just like you said that day yeah. you're staring in the mirror in London, you're like, what am I doing? And knowing you could go tomorrow, you might as well do what you're here to do today, you know? Exactly, exactly. Well, I, I'm just picturing you as a music therapist. I was blessed to work with a couple of music therapists who, whose uh, uh, primary instrument was a guitar. And that, and uh, I uh, also love to sing. I've done a good bit of singing in, in my life. And uh, and I've been able to use that at the bedside as well or in, in different um, um, services that we would have of remembrance and whatnot. But collaborating with the music therapist was always just the highlight of the day if I had a chance to do that. So nice. I could see you doing that work. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I could see you doing that work, especially mm -hmm. after checking out some of your videos. You seem to really have such a gift. You have a lot of love that comes through your music. and. I hope people that are that are people that might know me and might not John might not know John will really check out your YouTube, um, John Henry Sheridan. Uh, mm -hmm. Some really really beautiful work with with and for children. Some really beautiful acoustic music, some rock music, and mm -hmm. really great stuff. So. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, recognizing that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember one. Some of my yeah most meaningful musical moments uh, one time i went to i brought my guitar to a hospital to visit this older gentleman who was who was dying with cancer and he had met we met through an ad in, at a music store saying man she wanted someone to uh, help him create a book and he had all these songs that he wrote that for children and they were very amateur and you know unfortunately they weren't too too good or too well done but he wanted me to help him create this book and I just became his friend and, you know, I did my best with what he had. And then I just, I visited him in the hospital uh, at least maybe twice, at least once I it could have been hospital. No, I think it was a hospital. And um, it was a very interesting experience. Like when I went into his room, there was this like spark 
I'm sure you've experienced something like it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a soul or whatever it was, but it was this very pure moment that I've had only with a few people where like, just like everything kind of like lit, lit up when I was with him. He didn't die in my presence or anything, but, and then I, I brought my guitar. It was around Christmas time, I think. I guess it was December and that I just played a lot of Christmas songs that I know tons of Christmas songs and uh and he was just so happy and said you have such a gift you're so good at this but when I play those for my friends and family at Christmas dinner they half the time they just ignore me or just want me to <laughs> shut up you know I'm like but this guy really appreciates it like if I could share my gift with people who are, are hungry for it you know yeah anyway so I had a few you know old age homes things like that where I've played music and I really saw it made a difference at a homeless meal I remember playing and uh yeah I don't know it, it's it hasn't called me to dedicate myself exclusively to that but I felt like that was certainly just as valuable if not more than than playing in front of a bunch of people at, at a club you know yeah yeah it, it's a beautiful gift <clears throat> I can't leave the, the idea of singing at the bedside without telling a funny story on myself. Mm. And that is, uh, I had, an, when my uncle was passing away, I would visit him and, um, you know, chat with him, you know, offer to say a prayer or whatever. Well, this one day I went to visit him, he was pretty close to the end of his life. And I said, I said, Uncle Jerry, would you like me to sing for you? And he said, Oh, God, no. <laughs> That's great. And part of what's so funny about that is that we were a singing family. And once a year, he would give a party for my sister's birthday. And my mother always had us getting up and singing, you know, some show tune or something. Uh -huh. And and this was this happened all the time, so much so that we didn't think anything of it. But here, evidently, this poor man all these years was putting up with the five of us getting up and singing show tunes at his yearly party. <laughs> so uh -huh. here he is at his bedside and he's and I'm offering to sing. And he said, oh, God, no. So he finally got his wish. His truth came out, you know, <laughs> have a little piece or whatever. Just in That's case funny. anybody would might want to get too full of themselves about offering to sing. <laughs> That's, oh, believe me, I've had many humbling moments about my own <laughs> singing or guitar playing. Yeah, like I kept saying at my own holiday parties. It's like, all right, John. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, there's nothing quite like a family member to put you in your place. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so your bio speaks about your vision of collective return to wholeness as a divine human family. I like the way that sounds. It certainly resonates with me. Can yeah. you expand on what that means on a practical level in, in your daily life and maybe for our listeners, what that could mean to them? It sounds, you know, grandiose. So, Yeah, it, it does. It does sound kind of uh, big. The big idea. Um, I, I think what it really means to me is the opportunity to remember um, that we are children of the creator. <laughs> we are creative beings. Mm -hmm. That that which is the divine, however we might think of it, whether it's the energy of life or the power of love or the a, a more of a an idea of God, a traditional idea of God, that, and this is in many, many religions, which is what I loved about studying interfaith ministry was hearing all the different perspectives and what do they have in common. And there was this common con concept of God is one, this idea of the oneness of mm -hmm. the all, the oneness of creator with and creation, and the idea that everything is extension of that so so we as individual divine sparks as the, the jewish tradition would talk about the the shards of broken glass the, the vase and the shards of of light um that that each of us is that divine spark so this idea of returning to our collective uh wholeness um is this idea of identifying that spark within ourselves as of the divine you know and you know because christ would say the kingdom of heaven is within 
this idea of finding that that place within that is of the all and mm -hmm. then from that nurturing that relationship of the, you know the self with with the divine and then from that place of fullness and connection recognizing that in the brother and sister in every brother and sister regardless yeah. of how they're showing up because we all know that to meet someone in their woundedness or to attack their woundedness or our perception of their woundedness or their craziness or whatever judgments we may have to meet someone there is never going to bring them to love or bring mm -hmm. them to understand the love that they are and so i think you know this is certainly not my idea but it's it's the idea that is 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 ours i mean it's through every spirit tradition it's a knowing that we have it's a knowing that we have that we belong to each other and um so so i i hold that vision um i'm every bit of work and progress is the next guy and girl um toward that but it is it is the focus of my spiritual journey and frankly i see life as um i see life as a spiritual journey my i just got a new phrase from my son i don't know where it is but um I, I was just listening to one of my son happened to be on a podcast the other day and he sent it over to me and then the name of the podcast was uh, spirituality spirituality colon dealing with matters of ultimate concern. Cool. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah well, the uh, the uh, host was Kyle Thierman, T H I E R M A N N. And he was interviewing uh, Chris Keener, who is my son, who does breath work, and he's a filmmaker. And it was it was a great discussion between the two of them. But they were talking about spirituality as matters, uh, you know, dealing with matters of ultimate concern. And I love that because there's so much baggage around, you know, religion and spirituality, and and it just can lead to divisiveness. Yeah. But you know that they they are the matters that is the matter of ultimate concern the who am i mm -hmm. who am i how did how did i get here what am i going why why am i here you know what's with that guy <laughs> how yeah. do i make this work you know so anyway yeah oh no that's great um yeah very natural to talk to you where, where our thinking is similar on many levels um yeah, I, I really feel more and more as I'm getting older. I just I turned 40 this year. I, I will turn 41 in December. And uh, I did. I, I just feel more and more this year that uh, despite the aches and pains that I have now <laughs> at my age, for whatever reason, I hope to be feel healthier and, and better as I get older. And, you know, with change in my lifestyle and stuff. But um, I feel like life is a dream. It's been said so many times by so many wisdom, you know, wise sages and whatnot. But I do feel it like it, when I really put my mind to have a certain day and I, I focus on the, the important things that well, I'd like to see happen that day or to, to the energies that I'd like to see arise, it, they, it happens almost without fail. You know, and it's like, wow, we really have a, and that's really a co creative stance, I would say. Absolutely. You know? absolutely that, that we are creating our 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 reality we have that opportunity yeah yeah and and like yourself i, I went to catholic school for uh the uh, first 10 years of my life I, I don't know how many years you went to and uh, then i went to public school and um and now and i did practice catholicism i did pray every night for for the most part and uh you know i've said my lord's prayer and hail mary's and all that and I pray to God and Jesus, and I still really love that the Jesus story, and I look up to him as a figure. Um, I have a Bible in my house, uh, but I've been practicing Buddhism for 12 years now, actively, daily. I chant nam myoho renge kyo and I actually felt I became a Buddhist I, officially when I was 28, and I, I, I felt like uh, that, that my... Um, my highest way to follow Jesus was actually 
to to become a Buddhist. But I felt like I, that would be that was the dying that I needed to do to my former self and enter this new this new wow. realm of being. You know, I I I, I love that, and I, I honestly. You know, not to embarrass you, but I've seen that in you. In our our group, we were talking about just to reiterate was a, it was a, a we met through a, a book book writing incubator program. So we're both mm -hmm. involved in writing. And um, John Henry, honestly, your loving kindness was so apparent that I understood there was a Buddhist undertone to your orientation mm -hmm. um, because no one would no one would be left without an affirmation after sharing their work. A very quiet, calm, but affirming, thank you for sharing that. I really got something out of that. And um, just your manner, you, you do have that sense of loving kindness. And what was Jesus if not teaching loving kindness? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, wow. So thank you for, for recognizing that. Yeah, so yeah. that's... I certainly feel for, for a long time, Jesus was one of my, uh, my uh, role models, I would say still is in a way. Um, and, uh, but of course I mix role models with also heavy metal stars and stuff like that. So they're, they're you know, <laughs> it was quite an adventure, but Jesus, you know, his message was, is a quite, quite a bit more stronger than uh, most of the heavy metal guys that I, I looked up to, but, um, but and Buddha, if, if you want to focus on a Buddha, I, I, there's a teacher named Nichiren Daishonin who founded the Buddhism I um, follow. Uh, I practice, and and then there's presidents that have came in. The, who one our third president of the SGI, which I practice with the SGI. Third president is still alive, and he still encourages us all the time. And I look up to him as a mentor. So I have this. I do have people that I can. Uh, reflect like you know the, the saying what would Jesus do I generally don't ask that anymore but I would ask like what would Daisaku Ikeda do or Nitrin Daishonin these current mentors mm -hmm. and even someone like Gandhi you know and just to kind of gauge where my behavior is if it's way off then I know that uh, I'm probably coming from the smaller mm -hmm. self but it's if it's similar not not to like copy what they would do but in the, is, is it the same spirit of yeah. what these mentors would do and I try to work with that and I was I was a Buddhist leader for seven years and uh you know it trained me a lot it was not easy but it certainly uh, helped me grow and I'm very glad I had the chance to uh serve people in that way I, I know you have experience much experience serving you know others yeah uh so well, yeah thank you for that yeah, well, I, I do I do honor the tradition that I was born into with with great, great love and humility. And um, I just always from age, I think I was in seventh grade when I started asking questions that were somehow inappropriate. But I think that the thing that I always struggled with was um, how can there be only one one way to God in terms of uh, beliefs where others are excluded. And, and, and I do believe there is one way to knowing uh, God, and that is being, you know, knowing God is being love. <laughs> and Jesus was the, the, you know, quintessential teacher of come to show us that. And, and I love that he said, you know, as I am, so shall you be. He was calling us to be as he was. Mm -hmm. and, and and that that really spoke to me, you know, uh, not not that I would, you know, I, I don't know too many people that have claimed that level of mastery and, and I wouldn't, it's not a, I don't think it's a contest. <laughs> yeah. I think mm -hmm. it was a, a life of demonstration of giving mm -hmm. one's over completely to love and, um, you know, I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. But I, I always said, I, Catholicism was my first language, uh, but I don't believe it, that's the only way to communicate. <laughs> sure. you know, I don't believe there's only one language. So, right. um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that what, that's what led me to interfaith. 
but I do have a deep, you know, appreciation for all of the traditions. And I do think that many people are called to drink deeply from one well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, totally. and, and drink deeply, deeply from one well and people's spirituality can come every, every bit as uh, extremely focused on one tradition. I just, that's not where it came from me. It yeah. came from being the common denominator of the various traditions, which are wholeness, love, belonging, and union, that we're mm -hmm. called to union. Right, compassion and yeah, some degree of discipline, certainly self-love, right? That's a big, yeah, big that, one. Yeah, that's a big one. And that's not one they're gonna teach you in Catholic school. No, <laughs> I'll exactly. tell you that. Definitely that was, not. Yeah. No, we learned no. how to love the other before we learned how to love ourselves. So that was a little that was a little tricky, but yeah, yeah, I, I had a, a big history of um, I would say older brother syndrome. Like I, I don't know, but I don't say martyr syndrome. But uh, yeah, because I, I, my father died when I was six, so it was my yeah. mother, brother who was four years younger than me, and so he was two, and I was six. So I was like the man of the house, and or at least I felt like I was, you know. And it was the eight, early uh, mid '80s, so it was, it was a scary time kidnappings and stuff when you're a kid you hear about things and anyway so I just felt like I need to put you know my own I didn't like mess around that much when I was young you know I put it that way so I, I was more on the responsible side just think kind of out of fear because yeah. my, my father died what if my mother dies I gotta be good you know because you know things happen and it wasn't so much later that I and I, I, I never really I never had the I, I hate God phase. I didn't go through that, but I did feel like, what the heck is this all about? I did have a dark night of the soul for a few years. And then I tried Lutheranism for a while because my mom's a Lutheran. Uh, and then that wasn't right. And, and I kept searching. I went to India and I, uh, I went to a Sikh temple. I explored Hinduism. I went to various, a couple Jewish uh, ceremonies. And I went to... Uh, Quaker uh, meetings in downtown Brooklyn. That was the closest thing I got to something that I was interested in joining, the Friends Society. Yeah. But something wasn't quite there for me. And then, then it was this form of Buddhism. Buddhism was always beautiful to me, but it was this particular form that really felt universal, similar to how mm -hmm. Catholicism is universal in its best sense. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, if you come to a meeting of SGI, it's, you see all different colors, different uh, religious backgrounds, you know, very ordinary people, you know, you don't have to be any which way, you know, yeah, very accepting of all sexuality types. So that, that was what I was always seeking, like yourself in Catholicism, like my, my good friend is Jewish. My, my, uh, two of my good friends are Jewish in high school and I had a Jewish girlfriend, like, are they going to hell? And it, it did seem like sometimes you hear things are like, if you're not a believer, there's just no hope for you. And I'm like, what about the people in Africa who never encountered, you know, just didn't make any sense. But still, there are examples of Catholics who really have a pure heart and it really does work for them. And you got people like St. Francis and there are really models of people that, like you said, they drink from the one well deeply. Yeah. And, and for them, it, it really works. So I wouldn't want to tell anyone not to be this or that. But for me, it, I was too much of a truth seeker. I needed those answers. It sounds like you too. Yeah, yeah and, and then exploring the different religions was so great. You know, I remember yeah. feeling in India, I was like, Hinduism is so cool, but if I became a Hindu, I might as well be a Catholic because it's equally, uh, it's equally doesn't make, it's not, um, I can't find the right word. Is equally like extravagant kind of um mm. wasn't totally logical you know like buddhism i find is very based on uh not not logic but based on reason you know and mm. um that that's that's anyway, that's why i went with it but again no, no disrespect to any religion that i i go to catholic churches regularly because i like holy spaces sacred places mm -hmm. and you can't really find any others around here where i live that open that welcome you, you know. Uh, yeah. Any place where where people gather to to 
any place where people come together as sacred space to yeah. remember their creator, worship mm -hmm. their creator, join together. I mean, there's just a vibration in that kind of a place that, you know, is, is we can feel it. We can feel the energy of that, the energy of love. It's good stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I seek it wherever I go. And when I lived in Japan, there wasn't Catholic churches around. I, th I knew there was, there was one or two churches where I was, but I didn't really feel so drawn to there. And, but I mainly felt drawn to many temples, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the temples and shrines that were everywhere that are oh, a form of Buddhism that I don't practice. And in some ways is not really in accord with the Buddhism I practice. But I saw it as a, because I was a Westerner, I felt like uh, me honoring, because it represents Japan, it's like a symbol of Japan. So for me to honor these shrines and temples as a sure. Westerner, I think that that was the greater good, even if it Absolutely. wasn't my so belief, you know, like to, to bow yeah. if I'm there, you know. And so Absolutely. I practice my religion and I chant my chant, but I, I will show respect there. And, and, and I visit them regularly because they're so beautiful and they have that they're much older generally than things you find here you know like you you in kyoto those buildings uh temples are very, very old some of them mm -hmm. and uh yeah so i just felt like always being in those sacred spaces i'm always drawn to i love cemeteries do you love cemeteries you probably do huh? <laughs> <laughs> in a laugh yeah I, I have pictures of me in cemeteries all over the world particularly in ireland i just think the, the celtic cross is so beautiful and, oh, yeah, uh, but yeah i you know, guilty. I love <laughs> my favorite place in Brooklyn, uh, by besides the the nature trail around around my house, is uh, Greenwood Cemetery. It's, mm. it's, if you ever get a chance when you're in Brooklyn, or maybe tell your your son about it, or, uh, your family members to visit. It's nearby Prospect Park, and uh, oh, it's I'm... it's so big. Are you familiar with Greenwood? Uh, no, I'm not, but I'm sure they are because oh, they yeah. are there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some people live in Brooklyn may never ever go, but it, it's a, it's kind of a something you don't want to miss. You can get you could literally get lost in there with a car. That's how big it is. <laughs> Seriously, wow. I know we get we get yeah. lost every time, even though I've been there. <laughs> so many we times. have a, we have a joke in our family because our 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 family is buried really right down the street from where I am, and it's a bit it's also a big uh, uh, cemetery called Holy Sepulchre, which is out in um, Glenside area. And um, we, we always, the, the directions to our family plot is left at Felix Hamlin because there's a big, there's a li little modest mausoleum to a guy named Felix Hamlin right where you have to turn. So I, I've often said to my family, I think it'd be a fun uh, literary challenge because my we, a lot of people in my family love to write. And uh, I said, it'd be a fun literary challenge to say, okay, you got, you know, in 300 words, the topic is left at Felix Hamlin. What do you come up with? That's cool. I like that. That's a good both? prompt, you know, yeah, a good, good fun prompt. prompt. A, a writing prompt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can go in all sorts of directions, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, perfect segue I mean, to my next question. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the book you were writing? Well, yes, and I, I, you have butterflies saying it because I have made this commitment to myself to write this book. We did this uh, wonderful incubator program, and then I, I have lost, uh, not lost, uh, I've lost momentum on the project because of uh, uh, I had a, a the loss of my brother two months ago, and another. Uh, my elder, my one and only elder had a very serious accident and I've been uh, helping to, to care for her and get her the care that she needs since that time. So the last couple months um, have been pretty challenging and I put the writing aside. So I say that as, you know, as a caveat, like I'm a writer, but I'm not writing right this minute. But um, I'm very excited about this project because um, I feel that it was an invitation for me. Um, and um, the book that I'm writing, uh, the working title right now uh, is, um, Can You Hear Me Now? The Relentless Call of the Divine to Be Loved. Mm -hmm. 
and beloved is beloved with the capital L in the middle. And where that comes from is the fact that in my work, um, I learned in pastoral care education, as I went in to meet or greet a patient and their family, to take a moment and remember what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And my version of that was, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? Mm -hmm. And help me to leave. I have a nickname of lady. A lot of my friends and family call me lady. So I would say, help me to leave the Lady Burke show at the door. Nice. You know, mm -hmm. and what would you have me do? What would you have me say? So after about several months of doing hospice work, I found that one day, and I kind of, I do remember where I was. I was in a residential hospice house where I worked. And I was going into a specific room and I was mentally saying that as I went through the doorway, tell me, you know, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? And I, you know, kind of heard in, in some, in a non-sound voice, you know, how you mm -hmm. kind of hear words sometimes or some people do. Feel them and I, yeah. I don't have it often, but I have had it. And this day I, I heard, um, just tell them, I love them. Tell, tell them, I love them. Tell them in whatever way you think they will understand. And that's what I did. Um, I mean, that's, that's how I practiced as a chaplain with the intention of how can I possibly relay how loved they are. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, the, that there is a relentless call from our creator to each of us, relentless mm -hmm. to just be loved. You know, all the, the parables that talk about, look at the lilies of the field and the birds of the air and look around you and see how you are cared for and see how I love you and see how love surrounds you. And um, so the book is um, taking different stories of interactions with patients and families and, um, telling the stories and then kind of pulling out themes that I that I took from whether it would be gratitude or trust or different themes uh, from the stories and then I'm also hoping to incorporate some invitation to the reader for exploring those those themes mm -hmm. you know in service of um, at the end of the book feeling a little more loved by mm -hmm. our creator you know? wow. Wow. So yeah, that, I that's the goal. I remember hearing a couple of times, you read at least once. Did you read more than once? I don't remember. I think I read twice. I think I read two yeah. different Yeah. I feel like yeah, I heard more than once. And uh, both times just totally brought us, drew me right in. I was there in the room with you, wherever you were speaking of. And, and I got it. I understood why you want to write this book. This is your calling. And you have a lot to say about this topic. And there's no it wouldn't be fair if you didn't share it, you know, kind of like oh, that feeling. Thanks. thanks. Right. Because you're a repository of all this unique knowledge and wisdom that, uh, and insight. So. It, well, it's funny too. I found that some of the stories that are coming to me are not necessarily from the hospice work, you know, mm -hmm. but just from life. So sure. that's, that's been new and interesting. Um, and also stories that I thought I was going to write about. Uh, I didn't. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, others came to me unexpectedly or through colleagues. I have a great posse of, of hospice team members, uh, nurses, social workers, and who, music therapists who have become really dear friends over the years. And they'll, yeah, hey, Helen, remember that time that this happened or that happened? And they'll remind me of different stories of, of uh, interactions we had with families and some really beautiful, beautiful moments, but also some fun moments. You know, mm -hmm. we had cocktail parties with people. We had a casino night with one lady. We had, you know, we, 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 brought, we brought life to the end of, you know, life all the way up to the end of life. Uh, and then there were solemn moments as well. So, mm -hmm. so we had some, we had some uh, beautiful, beautiful stories. And it, and it is fun to share them. And we, it's fun to reflect on them. Yeah, I think I always felt um, a soft spot for 
older people. Uh, also a soft spot for women because I was raised by my mother and grandmother primarily. And uh, so it just reminded me that, um, so uh, my mother's mother passed away in 99 and that was one of the, the trials I had as a family to see her go. She was very, very close to me and, and my brother. So that was very sad and heartbreaking. And she was dying kind of slowly and it was, it was tough, you know. And she lived in the house with us. And, um, then anyway, years later, my mother befriended a neighbor who was a lone, lone soul. Her name is Ro Rosemary. And uh, she was like a rose. She was beautiful, but she was very thorny. Hmm. And she didn't have friends because of that. Uh, very few. We were kind of, my mother just took it upon herself. My mother's mother had passed. She saw this older woman and this older woman's sister who passed. And Rosemary and Rosemary had no other family. So my mother would pass by and say, hey, I'm going to the store. Can I get you something? And eventually they became friends. And then one day Rosemary said, hey, would your son be willing to drive me to the cemetery? Because maybe he could use the money. I'd rather give him the money than a uh, car service guy because she was going to the Bronx and paying $120 for uh, uh, this huge day, day trip. So I said, my, my grand my nana, my mother's mother had passed and I'm like, yeah, I'll spend the day with this older woman and get to know her, you know, like I kind of miss spending time with an older woman. And uh, yeah, she was not like my, my own grandmother, but she became like, like a new grandmother to me. Mm. And uh, she was like a, and I, to her, I became like a father, a son, a boyfriend, any which role you can name. I was that because she didn't really have any other male friends in her life you know anyway to make a long story short at some point she said john when i die do you want to live in my house and uh i was like i don't know i might live in japan i might i don't know where i want to but anyway i thought about it and mentioned to yoko by the time i got married and, and that's where we live we live in rosemary's house now rosemary oh, passed wow. on what a great story yeah, and that's we're so protected by her spirit and her what a beautiful spirit, step. incredible. Yeah, and as she was going, there's so many times she just said, "I, I wish God would just take me. Uh, I want to die." But we was like I said, she was thorny. But so we were just always there, to try to comfort her as much much as possible. And then um, when she was in, I don't know if it was if it's called hospice, but it was like. It's kind of like the last stop uh, sunrise hip facility. You might've know that name, I don't know. But anyway, it, there are a lot of people just go there for their last stage of life. And um, she had an apartment. And one night, I was still living in Japan, but we came home for a month or something. And I decided I gotta spend time with Rosemary. This is before we lived in America and lived in her house. And we went to, to this apartment where she lived in and my wife and I both slept over and we watched, we went out to like uh, Applebee's together and she had a drink. And then we went back and we watched Wizard of Oz together and slept on the floor. And uh, yeah, you know, and I guess she, I may not have ever seen her after that. That might have been the last time I saw her. I don't remember um, that she passed away shortly after, well, like within a year, but I was not living there. So yeah, I, I totally, totally know what you mean. You could have fun with it doesn't have to be heavy. And someone like her, right. she didn't want to stick around anymore. So, so how much sadness can you feel beyond lo losing a friend and losing that presence in your life? You know, it, it's just it's all different colors. I also love th that story because it is another, I have a couple sayings that I always used to, they used to kid me at hospice. One is God's got it covered. And the other is that, uh, or, and can you hear me now? Because it was just amazing all the times that you know, God would show God's love, you know, and like, how can you miss it? Can you hear me now? You know, mm -hmm. um, but the other one was that you can't outgive God. And I think your story is a great example of that, that when we lean into our union with our brother and sister, we, when we take care of one another, you know, and it's, it's not if this, then that, but it just mm -hmm. happens to, it, it's when you're living a life of love, love finds you and grace and grace surrounds you you know and so there are gifts there are gifts that come that we don't expect out of our leaning into others and and i i, I love your story because of that that you are gifted with this wonderful home um 
and you know part of that story is your gifting rose with your love and, and attention you know it's mm -hmm. a beautiful story yeah thank you and that reminds me you said it very well that this feeling i've had all this time like it was always I, i've never been good at making money it's not that i never made money but it's never been my strong point and for various reasons but one of these reasons was like i could see if i do this or that and kind of like betray my my heart I can make a lot of money, maybe, or some money. Never, I never had any, I never conceived of any way I could possibly make a lot of money, but at least more money than I was. But I always felt what I want to be doing is spending time with people that I care about, doing my passion, putting out my art, even if even if just a handful of people would experience it, you know? It's just because I, because I always had this consciousness of death, probably because my dad died when I was six. Like, what do I want to leave behind? I want to leave behind a legacy of a person that, that was true to his art. That was just like a kind, a kind freaking person, you know. <laughs> and I, that that must must count for more than <laughs> anything else in, in a way, right? <laughs> and and so I felt there there were these times like that time with you know Rosemary. We had we got a house. Of course, I knew throughout the years that there was a possibility. She was she helped me go to, go to grad school for a year. It wasn't for me, but she paid for for one year. It was a loan, but she didn't really want me to pay her back. And then, uh, you know, so, and then there was when my grandmother died, I received some money. So I was able to travel. And then I went to London and I experienced Scottish cemeteries at that time. So I always <laughs> found like there was some way, if I had a dream that I wanted, the universe would provide me. It's not like you wait for someone to die to do something, but I always felt like there were always a surprise. And I would, if I just held out long enough, I wouldn't have to betray myself. I can continue to be myself. The universe wants me to be myself. Well, that's you know? it. And I think trusting in that, trusting in, trusting in the power, you know, I was, I think, who was the teacher? There's a teacher called Robert Young, who talks about infinite trust. It's a man, very few words, but boy, when he talks about trust, is I don't know, it's, it's a visceral teaching. It's, I can't even express it, but when, when you think of the words infinite trust in the divine, infinite trust in love, and you move forward in that, knowing that you are the lily of the field, you are the bird of the air, you will be provided for. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's, there's a, a tremendous power in that. And that's kind of what you're describing in living a life where you're giving of yourself you're giving of who you are and you know the compensation comes and I, I you know I'm I'm not against learning about money making and things like that it's not my forte either but I do know that I've had a, a life of uh, from food stamps to tremendous abundance uh, you know when we were newlyweds we were very poor and um but we always had family and friends and uh, yeah, I don't know, God provides, God yeah. provides. Right, I, I love and that. And we're here to trust. provide for each other. And we're, and we're here to provide for each other, you know? That, that's the other thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think, um, I find, like when I was in Brazil, I did humanitarian work in Brazil and uh, with, with Yoko, before she was my wife, we were partners there uh, or teammates and, uh, I remember just walking around this, we, li we were living in a very small village called Lagoa de Baja, which is outside of a very, like the, the poorest uh, town in Bahia, the state of Bahia, called Kijini. It's one of like the, the top, uh, out of 500 sit towns, it's like one of the 500, uh, 440, 99th poorest. That, that's whatever, that was on, on the paper. That's what we saw, whatever that means, right? Uh, but then we lived in a village outside of that, like an hour drive away. So we were really with very few resources, um, no running water. Uh, we didn't have a TV. The neighbors did. They somehow managed that. Anyway, the people that we lived with, they didn't have money. They, they could make money maybe like three months out of the year during like harvest season. Otherwise, most of the husbands were just sitting around all day for nine months and uh i couldn't judge them 
you know, their, their education is so limited. Their resources were nothing like me. I felt like a prince, you know, maybe they would have to travel to get a one-way ticket to a distant city, a big city to, to get a job and work. And then maybe six months they can come back and share some money. Like it was a very different reality, but, but I learned not to judge anyone and see that, Hey, these guys are not living in the same type of fear, anxiety that the people that I know in New York are living with. And a lot of them seem to be happier than people that I know with, with much more, you know, material abundance. So I'm like, what the heck are we doing? You know, so I, I just learned this sort of fearlessness going forward. Like as long as my heart's in the right place and I'm, I'm, I'm intending to benefit the community that I'm a part of to become invaluable in some way, then I'll be fine. And, you know, and, and I should, I, I, I don't need to, to want much more than that. I, I, and with that philosophy, I, you know, living in this house and people always give me instruments. They give my son all sorts of toys. I maybe bought my son three toys. He's six years old. Seriously, three toys his whole life. <laughs> but he has rooms full. You would never guess. You'd think I spoil him. But I, I ne- almost never bought him anything. And it, it just comes. And more than we need. And when we try to give things to people, uh, you know, and I just find this uh, living in this this trust and this faith, you know, that the universe will provide. It's the only fair thing, because how could I not, if, I, if you don't think that way, then, then you kind of think that everyone in the, in the world who's poor is screwed. Because, you know, that, that community I saw, they have no leverage. They're not going to be able to get too, too many rungs up the ladder. So I have to believe that it's okay. You know, whoever you are, however you are, just having faith, you'll get, be provided for you know? Well, I think that's, you know, one of the advantages of being able to travel internationally like that and really be with people from very different backgrounds is, you know, a lot of our preconceived notions are, you know, kind of turned upside down. And and that's not to dismiss the suffering that there is, but there's also a lot of joy and there's, uh, and resiliency and, um, you know, and yeah. Yeah, and, and just different uh, sort of philosophies on life, you know. Right. Right. They, they, the, the adults, not only the kids, the adults were out 5 p.m. every day. Maybe not on weekends. But I'm pretty sure every day, 5 p.m. for a soccer game, out in the field playing soccer. You don't yeah. see adults are doing that here. <laughs> and in you China, know? and in China, I found um, that where we went, uh, we went to. Uh, Guilin is where we were and uh in the morning all the all the adults came out at like six or seven in the morning to do ballroom dancing wow. in the square <laughs> I was like what you know all kinds of wonderful but you know the the idea of people sharing music people sharing food people sharing sport nature mm-hmm. it happens all over the world so yeah yeah um so I. Uh, I have uh, my next uh, point, talking point is just creative expression. Um, I don't know exactly any question to open that up with, but for me, it's a huge part of my life. Can you speak to what it means to you? Well, actually, um, I, I was thinking about this as well today. Uh, I think we, you know, we talked about that we both, I, I love to sing. And, uh, but also my brother who just passed away, uh, Mike, Mike, my brother, Mike, uh, loved guitar. He played guitar, and uh, sometimes we did some music together. Um, and uh, actually, I was at a wedding the other day, and uh, I heard the um, the um, entertainers were playing the song Neil Young's "Harvest Moon," uh-huh. and that was the song that we had played together. And uh, oh, nice. I just felt that was a little that was a little wink from my brother saying hi to me. It really touched me deeply because yeah. also because my brother was an arborist and the wedding was in an arboretum. So it yeah. was where where he was a member and we had been together often. So it was oh, just wow. a really sweet thing. Anyway, all of that to say, my brother had two guitars, one of which he gifted to my cousin, who is a, a, a very accomplished musician. And um, my sister-in-law, uh, I asked my sister-in-law if I could have, he had a four string tenor guitar that I remember learning a few chords 
uh, not on that particular guitar, but on another one that my sister had when we were younger. And I remembered, uh, I just remembered these few chords and I, I just had this urge to ask her for this. Could I hold on to this for a while and, and see if I use it? So I've been playing with it a little bit. Uh, it's, it's tuned like a baritone ukulele that mm -hmm. makes sense to you. And um, there, I've learned, I've already learned how to play two songs. And, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I may be tagging you later for some guitar lessons because <laughs> I really don't know what I'm doing. So, so yeah, so that's creativity is guitar. You know, that's a brand new thing that I have no idea if I'll get any good at, but I do um, enjoy, I've always enjoyed, you know, photography. I've enjoyed writing. I've enjoyed, um, doing a little bit of art, um, but the art that I really kind of am excited about that's kind of new to me in the last five years is uh, clay, work in clay. So I've been doing some um, sculpture and um, making some, you know, platters and things like that. Um, I've also made some tiles for backsplash in my kitchen and things like that. So I, I really, I have a wonderful, wonderful teacher and a great group of women friends who, who uh, get together. I, I have a, what I call a, a spiritual circle, a circle of women who have been reading um, sacred texts for 12 years together weekly. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, great. it's pretty unusual. Uh, and one of those women is a master um, potter and she, and sculptor, and uh, she uh, gives lessons to a few of us are, or a, kind of a subgroup there and go and take clay with her. So I enjoy that. Mm. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're kind of my creative outlets right now and the writing. Sometimes mm -hmm. I write, I've written a few songs actually and right. I've written a little bit of poetry. Wow. Only, only one of my songs I recorded, but oh, uh, yeah. That's great. It, it sounds like you're uh very childlike in, in, in the best of the word, in the sense that you just want to keep playing, right? Just playing with life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm, I take everything a little too seriously. So it's good for me to kind of not do that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there, there is always that, that yin yang balance between yeah. uh, things like theater, between uh, comedy and tragedy, but you have to kind right. of have both. Both, right. both and neither, in, in a sense, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's inspiring that you just keep having fun. I, I used I, to do theater when I was a kid, but I, I haven't done that in a long time. Theater too, yeah. Yeah. When I was like a, in my teen years, I was in a lot of high school musicals and we had a we, we were in a, a musical uh, a group in uh, South Jersey, the Avalon Players. We were actually the first the first group to start a group that's still still going. They still put on plays down there. We were we my buddy, one of my friends, started it. Wow. We were the first couple of shows. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, wow. Well, seems like you've planted many seeds in your life and uh, mm -hmm. have left a real mark, you know, on, on the earth for, for the better, from what I could tell. Yeah. You know, creatively, uh, for me, you know, obviously the music, right? But um, music's become a little boring to me. Uh, not Maybe not boring, but it just doesn't call me, you know? Uh, there's practical reasons for that. And um, I'm very focused on writing these days, and I really do want to gear myself towards being an author, you know. Uh, my book should be coming out in the fall, Mind Your Music. Not my autobiography, that'll be possibly next year. Um, what, and tell everybody what your book is about. I know it's a uh, teaching book, right? Um, well, well, this book is called Mind Your Music. And yeah, I guess you kind of consider it, I, I call it a teaching memoir and a uh, self-help book, a self-help philosophy book. Wow. Yeah. So it, it basically presents this concept that music is so powerful and that it can influence us in both positive and negative ways. And uh, that we're all vibrationally sensitive beings. So that if we're not cognizant of that, since we live in a, a media saturated world, it could actually be inadvertently, uh, you know, detracting from our life music. So to be really hyper hyper aware just just be very aware of whatever we listen to what we choose to listen to because it could truly benefit us 
very similar to the food we eat. You know, I say, I flip it instead of you are what you eat. I say, we are what we consume and yeah. including music, you know? So it's, it's about that. So I present my, my theory kind of, and, and then why, why it's important to think of that about this right now. And then some of the benefits of music, and then I help people to go through the process in their own life. And, um, I give a bunch of recommended listening and stuff like that. That's basically the book. Love it. Love it. Thanks. Yeah. And believe me, it, it was a surprising wrestling match. Not, not to, not to um, intimidate you as, as an author yourself, but, but for <laughs> me, because I, I published this in 2016, it's called music for health. And then I just wanted to, it was only an ebook. So I really wanted to put it out as a paperback, but every time I tried to, go through the process i would read through it i'm like no i, I gotta change that because i put I, I wrote the book in a, in a day and then i initially 2016 and then i uh re, over the course of eight days i wrote it in a day then finessed it and came up with a cover and by the eighth day i, I published it wow. just as a challenge to myself so i was so busy yeah. i used that last week in the end of the year to do it i i had a program 24 how to write a book in 24 hours i i used it so it was very not perfect, but I'm so glad I did it. And then I did this huge thing finally in 2021, where since March, I've been doing this rewrite with an editor and I retitled it. It's a new book and it's been, she keeps challenging me to be my best. She knows that I could bring out more and she'll, yeah. she'll give it back to me like, well, you could, what about this? And I know she's right, so I keep on going, taking up the challenge, and uh, and going back and seeing what I come up with. And at this point, it's, it's, it has a totally different flow. I, I look, I've, I've read, been reading through it a lot because we're in that last stage here, and I'm like, who wrote this book? You know, it's really, it's, I could, it really makes sense to me. You know, sometimes you read your own writing, it doesn't even make sense anymore. Right, but I'm right. reading it, I'm, you know, but I'm reading, I'm like, oh wow, I, I get it. Wow. I get what this person's well, saying. What a great gift of in collaboration. So you found a great editor and you know yeah. where two or more are gathered good stuff happens <laughs> in I the know. name you know in a, in a creative endeavor and you know uh yeah it's great yeah with, with some faith involved you know i i find with my editor and my editor andy who i've had on the podcast there's a, there's a show with her andy um we've had this uh you know willingness to get to know each other so whenever we have a work call we still talk to each other as, as friends and that, that just, I feel it helps so much yeah. to kind of get to know a person. Um, yeah, she has uh, quite a rich life. If anybody wants to check out that podcast, um, Andy, it's in the music philosophy and more uh, okay. playlist. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, so recently in terms of creativity, what I've been doing, I painted my, my basement wall. It did this like waterproofing thing and it's that's kind of it's created it's something i would only do because i have to do and i have the the kind of this sense that i should really maintain the house you know so i've been doing that i just did my laundry room so i learned how to unplug my washing machine and my dryer unhook it and then hook it back up that was very scary to me for a long time you know because i'm not that inclined uh -huh. you know and now i have it in my head i've got a lot of old old wood or or uh, scrap wood in my in garage i really want to build a, a shelf to for storage we're, nice. we're pretty good at decluttering but you still got stuff you know so i want to build that so i'm letting my creativity go in different directions that's great you know that's and great. These, by doing that like more the house stuff then i talk to my neighbors i i could relate to my the people in my environment differently than if i'm just focusing on just playing guitar all the time and right you know staying in a similar vein so. Absolutely. Well, also, I want to uh, comment about your um, planet. Friendship planet. Pl Friendship planet video. People should totally check that out. That's so <laughs> fun. That's so fun. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link Friendship to that in planet. the show notes. Because so, that was, I mean, that's not just music. That's film and editing. And, you know, that's that's a lot of a lot of production in that. It was a beautiful yeah. project. Love it. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Uh, believe it or not, I wrote that song in 2013. Could have been 2014. I think about 2013 as like this, because I came from a heavy metal rock background. 
And then as like the mind your music, my book's name is mind your music. The message has always been like being conscious of music. So I went through this really rough stage of like kind of giving up the music I love because I felt the toxic elements in it, but I still love heavy metal and rock, but I want to have a positive message. So this song was my attempt to make a rock song that was just very positive, but still cool to listen to. Yeah. You know, it was great. It was great. And also the one on, um, the, about the American Revolution, because you're quite, the, as an educator, that, that was a great, I thought that was a great example of who you are, because you were so uh, entertaining, educating, uh, and it was a great, great video, so people should check that out, too, the American, the uh, rev Revolution. Yeah. What's it called? American Revolution. American Revolution, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I'll Good. put that in the notes, too, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, an illusion in that because I wasn't actually their teacher. I was there to help. So their main teacher was in the, on the sidelines, but that was, they needed, you know, I was the actor to be the teacher for the video. But yeah. I, yeah, I was very involved with all those kids and creating that song. And it was tremendous group effort, a lot of praying. Yeah. Well, the, to make that happen. the teachers and everybody, I mean, everybody played their part. It was great. It was really yeah. cute. Like what's going on in that classroom, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, was, right. That was that was, that was the, that was the actual principal who who's who that, played that's that role. What yeah, yeah, she is very cool. That was great. Um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so here's a topic that we discuss, and and if if you need to wrap it up, just let me know. I can go a little longer if you can. Uh, yeah, I'm just. I have a birthday call. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so what what's our uh, our time? How many what, more minutes what, would you what like time, to? What time is it, John? It's 6.13. Oh, we got 15 more minutes or okay. anything up or so. anything. Yeah, I have a call at 6.30, so that'd be great. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, awesome. So um, so uh, in terms of losing our way and surrendering uh, uh, as a developmental stage towards walk, waking up to our true nature, uh, maybe we could kind of end it with that part, portion of the dialogue. Sure. Because um, I know that there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, yeah, well, that and that was, you know, when you first invited me to to come chat with you and what ideas did I have? Um, I didn't know. But during that, um, during that vacation that I talked about, where we had all of our family down at the shore, one of the things I loved to do was to go down to the water very early by myself, sit, meditate at the water. And two days uh, was were particularly gorgeous and calm water. And I went out and I just floated in the ocean. And every once in a while, I would just put a foot down, make sure I wasn't out too far, but it was well before the guards came. And it was just a luxurious, luxurious experience of just floating. And um, this one morning, this thought came in so quickly that it's that said, I'm losing my way. And I, and I, and it scared me. It was like, I'm losing my way. Well, what, what does that mean? I'm losing my way. And just as quickly, a smile came to my mouth. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was a good news message. Mm -hmm. Like, no, this isn't bad news. You're losing your way. I'm losing my way. It's that's not bad news. This is good news. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that as part of human evolution, uh, starting with being a child, where you are in a symbiotic, you know, relationship with mother, mother and infant are one, right? From both perspective, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And then finally, the child is born and the, the child still for another six months perceives themselves as part of as part of the mother until slowly it's like, oh, that's my finger out <laughs> there. This yeah. individuation process happens. Right. And then you have the, you know, the kind of establishing identity that happens in the teens. And then there's, you know, I'm not I'm not you. <laughs> you I'm not. I'm, I'm me. Right. Right. And then. Uh, and then there's this idea of, but I know I'm part of something else. So there's this also peer belonging stuff happening at the same time, which is why the teenage years are so crazy. And then, you know, going into your 20s and 30s, you're really looking to find your way. You're really looking to find your way in life. You know, what's the kind of person I want to be with? What's, who's the kind of person I want to be? 
what kind of work do I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. Then next thing you know, your you know, family and so forth and so on. So at this particular stage of my life, I felt, you know, I just thought it was interesting that I'm 70 and it's like, I'm losing my way. Well, what the heck does that mean? You know, if, if I haven't found my way by now, mm -hmm. um, but it was this sense of a return to wholeness, a, re a sense of the return to, to really the focus on that aspect of myself that I, where I, that is one with all, that is one with God and one with, with my brothers and sisters. And, um, and, you know, the way is, 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 is a concept that is used in so many different spiritual traditions. You know, the, of course, the, the, in, ev in every single uh, tradition. Um, so I just, I, uh, I guess that was kind of it. It was that revelation to me that this is a time to um, kind of relinquish my way. What has mm -hmm. been my way? You know, what, what is there left for me to learn by giving up? Well, this is the way I do things. This is the way I think. This is the way it is. This is the way it should be, which by my age, we've all got a lot of pretty big ideas about the way things are and the way they should be. And gosh, darn it, I'm right. And you're not, you know? So this idea of losing my way and opening up to the way of the human, the way of human belonging and, and being held by the beloved is a very fascinating exploration and makes every day very different mm -hmm. because it makes, makes me question every interaction that I have, every judgment that I have. And mm -hmm. man, man, do we have judgments. I mean, yeah. when you get willing to start seeing the lens through which you see people, I was like, oh, give me some Windex, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, really, I got to clean this up, <laughs> right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's, it's uh, anyway, I, I thought that was really cool. And the reason that I, I immediately thought, this is what I want to talk to John about, because at the same time, I was hearing songs in my mind that reminded me of different stages like that, which, of course, now I don't, I don't remember any, except, uh, for example, Frank Sinatra, My Way. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, the, these last, certainly the, the 80s and 90s and, and, and thousands ha have been years of, you know, me, 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 <laughs> self, oh, yeah. you know, and the, the greatest love of all. And, and a lot of that's beautiful. You know, my way, the greatest love of all is happening to me, learning to love myself. I mean, these are all important steps, you know, mm -hmm. but I do think that I feel like I'm invited and I think that maybe we as a human family ultimately get invited to a place of really letting go everything we thought we knew and surrendering to a truth beyond our understanding which is union mm -hmm. and that's we're not going to see it as long as we're keeping ourselves separate and we're keeping ourselves right we're never going to see that place of belonging to one mm -hmm. another yeah wow so Yes, so beautifully said. I can imagine you sitting, you know, floating. I can imagine myself, you know, floating on the water in a beautiful climate and environment, it was and uh, and having that like that that moment of yeah, I'm losing my way. Especially for me, that would make sense because I'm not a great swimmer. So if I'm floating, <laughs> I can definitely feel like I'm losing my way and like, oh, what if you know, what if I go too far? And uh, I could see how that would come in. And, but yeah, so your time in life, it seems like 70, that could be, you know, something that would not be uncommon, maybe for people mm -hmm. to, going towards that era of their life. But also with the COVID, you know, in the COVID situation, climate, I think probably a lot more younger people are experiencing similar feelings of mm -hmm. losing the person that they were up until now, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we're recreating, you know, we're, I guess we're recreating ourselves anew each day or as 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 much as we're willing you know to be open to growing and open to learning and open to loving more mm -hmm. you know. we have one comment from uh alinda sheridan who uh i believe that's my mother who says <laughs> when you look with different eyes you see things differently 
Mm. Yeah, so just change, changing our, our eyes. I love in, that. In, yeah, in, in Buddhism, uh, we I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo every day. It's a vocal thing. I say it out loud, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And I look at, we look at a mandala as practitioners mm -hmm. called the Gohanzen. And the way it's often taught is that we're polishing our lives. We're basically polishing our mirror. And, you know, Nichiren Dai Shonen, yeah. this monk who established this was from the 13th century. So there's this idea that when you, a, a brass mirror gets dirty pretty, pretty quickly. So in order to see it, you have to polish it pretty vigorously and then you get wow. an accurate reflection. So when we, when we chant, we, we think about that, like I'm polishing the mirror of my life so that I, I get a clear reflection of in the world every day. So, And, you know, how perfect is that, that I use that analogy of the lens that we're seeing through and needing the Windex and you're sharing that that's your, your practice. I See, mm -hmm. I love synchronicities like that. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So when you said that, it made plenty of sense to me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's fun. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and also, I'm just reminded that, uh, yeah, this idea of feeling like one and, and, and losing the way. Yeah, I think, you know, not, no one's to blame, but I do think that the paradigm we live in, or if you want, or the, uh, the matrix, you hear that a lot. Not that matrix has to be bad, but it's a certain like, interwoven way that things work right a certain system of thinking that's so interwoven that thing over here reflects that over there so you think it's yeah. true but it's not necessarily true it's just this interwoven way that's a presentation of reality um and uh it could be a good matrix but i would say by and large the matrix we live in tends towards destructive tendencies and like the ego, more like the ego self right mm -hmm. like you were saying in the music of the past few decades for sure and I, I would say, unfortunately, music in this previous decade and the one before, the 2000, 2010s, because I was teaching music by decade for, for a class I gave, and it got much more difficult to find anything with any, any uh, in the popular, in the mainstream. You can find a lot of indie stuff, but anything in the mainstream with any, like, any value whatsoever that wasn't toxic, it was very hard in, in the past two decades. Uh, 90s and 80s was a bit easier. Of course, there's very, you know, what I call gray music, gray area music, somewhere between healthy and unhealthy, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think as a, as a society, we kind of, we need that, um, that losing our way on a grand scale, which I think has been happening, in order to find a different way. And for us, even the ones let's say perhaps you and I who feel that we were on a good path already, or, or at least help, what we perceive as a healthy path in our own lives, even for people like us who feel that way to also say, to still say, you know what, let me just start for, start over. Yeah. You know, let me just start from scratch for, for the sake of everybody, for the sake yeah. of all of us. And just, or even just that intention or that prayer, you know, show me, show me where I'm off. You yeah, know? right. So yeah. Tell me where I'm off. Should, and, you know, all we have to do, they say life is our best teacher. So anywhere we're off is going to show up in any day. And the question is, are we are we willing to look at it and see it? Are we willing to stop and say, oh, that's interesting how I just responded. Or why did I just roll my eyes at my neighbor, <laughs> you know, right. behind the back, you know, like what what thought process is going on there internally that I can clean up? you know, or, uh, you know, so nice. life is, is presenting those opportunities all the time. So the intention or prayer to let me, let me see a new today. Let me see through a new, let me polish the mirror. Let me, you know, polish the lens, uh, so that I can see what you would, what love would have me see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes try to remember in, in the process of writing my autobiography, I've tried to give each year of my life almost like the same amount of space. It's of course not gonna work out that way, but I tried to avoid the tendency of just focusing on like my successes in my you know, young adulthood or something or struggles. And I, even my childhood each year when I was zero, one, I tried to give at least 2000 words per year, just because I wanna remember that each step of my journey with, I was equally valuable, right? Yes. Me being more valuable because I achieved some guitar thing. No, no. no. You know, and so I, I try to remember that 
who was that John before he even wanted to play guitar? Who was that John before he even thought, realized that music was a thing? You know, it was just like beyond, it was just part of my life. But before I thought that that would, you know, or before I had this sense of responsibility, who was that, that baby, the little child yeah. that just wanted to play? And then by remembering that and that that was just as real me as any other me, I could, you know, do what you say, like, remember this, this whole thing, I, I'm very narrow, very specific, particular, that's molded by other parts of who, by other things, things outside myself, not that I, of my own choosing, and, and just to really try to find that pure essence. And it love always it. helps, you know, love always it. helps. I love that. So we have uh, two minutes. Uh, can you share any inspiring books or films with our viewers um, that come to mind that I could put in the show notes? Well, I'm sure most people have seen by now the fabulous fungi movie. Uh, have you seen that? No. Oh, it's really cool because it it's about mushrooms and the, you know, but the, about the interconnection of life. I, I can't even describe it, but it was awesome. And it, okay. it to me, it has a, a parallel of, of uh, it has many levels of significance. So fabulous fungi okay. um, uh, is a great film. Uh, I, I have been a student of a, a book called The Course of, A Course of Love by Mari okay. Perron, P-E-R-R-O-N. It is a sequel to A Course of Miracles, which is, is probably more widely known yeah. and stuff. Um, but uh, I often say A Course of Miracles uh, was great at telling us who we are as, uh, telling us, clarifying the difference between our ego and our higher self mm -hmm. and our true self, our true nature. And I always say A Course of Love is like, okay, now that you know that, now that you really know who you are, fasten your seatbelt because okay. we got places to go. I mean, it, it's, it's a really beautiful spiritual teaching. Um, nice. Yeah, so they're the two that just popped to the top of my mind. All right, cool. Yeah. And uh, uh, any, any last words? Because I want to let you go on time for our audience. Not oh, last words, but <laughs> any final comments? Oh, just a little gratitude for having an opportunity to do something I haven't done before. Uh, and also, uh, and, and uh, to have said yes to something that felt a little scary and challenging. Uh, and uh, a thank you to you for uh, getting to know you more. And uh, the only thing I wasn't nervous about was talking to you and that's all I had to do. So it made it a whole lot easier. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, thanks for listening. Anybody that took the time to listen, um, what a gift, to, a gift of intent, uh, attention. Um, is a mm -hmm. very beautiful thing. So whether it's you and I and your mom and Allie or whether other people have chimed in, uh, we're, we're grateful. We're grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, uh, Helen. And yeah. I, I'm glad we did it early in the day as you recommended it. It's really worked out for me too. Um, and uh, you have a wonderful birthday call. Happy belated birthday, I suppose. Thank you. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, be well. I'll send you the link so you can find it on YouTube and Facebook afterwards. I'll email it to you. And you that can sounds great. As you like. That All sounds right. great. Thank you, John. Have a wonderful night. You too. Take care, Helen.